Welcome to our virtual iHeart Science Festival. Today's theme is incredible evolution. We will soon hear from our next presenter, Hannah Svaka, who studies how fish use their sense of smell when they are stressed. Hannah is a postdoc in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Today, she'll be sharing her talk titled, Do Fish Smell? Let's welcome Hannah. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for joining. Um, let me just pull up my presentation. And I want to jump right in and ask you, did you know that fish smell? I mean, not like this one but that they can smell their environment. They can smell what's around them. They smell all kinds of things. For example, they can smell something that smells like roses to us, but they can also smell when another fish is hurt and then they swim away. But wait a minute, do fish actually have a nose? Well, this one obviously does, right? But let's look at a different fish. So here's another fish and we can see the fish has the nostrils right here. And actually fish only use their nose to smell. They don't use it to breathe like we do. They breathe through their mouth and their, their gills. But how do they smell something underwater? Well, if we smell something, the scent is dissolved in the wet lining of our nose for the fish that has basically already been taken care of in the water. So it's almost as if we're smelling underwater. So now I wanna ask you, what do you think? Which fish has a great nose? Is it the shark or the salmon or maybe the zebra fish? So um, I want you to guess uh, which fish do you think has a really great nose and smells great. For the shark here, we can already see the nostrils in, in this picture. So here are the results. Oh, most of you think it's the shark. That's interesting. The shark actually has a really great nose. And I think most of you probably have heard that a shark can smell a drop of water in the ocean. That's pretty exaggerated. But what they can smell is probably a blood, um, sorry, a, a drop of blood in a pool. So not in the ocean. And um, salmons also have really great nose. They can smell their way back from the ocean into the river they were born or hatched from an egg. You might not heard about uh, zebrafish yet. Zebrafish also can smell and have a great nose. And I put them here because that's what I study, the zebrafish. And lots of scientists around the world study the zebrafish. And today I want to tell you about my research. And I want to take you uh, into our lab. And uh, I hope all of you brought your mask and in we go. I want to tell you about the tiny, tiny fish we study and about big, big microscopes that we use uh, to look into their brains and how these fish react when they're stressed. And then I also want to show you some of the things that we see in the fish brain. So it might be hard to imagine, but zebrafish actually share a lot of genes with us. Have you heard about genes? Genes carry the information about our body, about your eye color, about your hair color, and even where your leg or your arm belongs. And when we study zebrafish, we might learn something about ourselves. When we look at them in the lab, we use a microscope. And they hatch out of eggs. And this is a one-day-old zebrafish egg, and you cannot see much yet. But at day two, you can already see the eyes developing. And after five days, we have a, what we call a zebrafish larvae. That's a tiny zebrafish, you could say a zebrafish baby. And they're very, very small. I brought you a video here and I want you to watch and see if you can tell how small they are. So here's our zebrafish larvae and it swims towards something that I put in the tank. And maybe you can guess what it is. It's a one cent coin. That's how small they are. And um, the video is not stopping. The fish actually moves like this. They swim in something we call bouts. And now the zebrafish has lost interest and swims away. But they're not only tiny, they're also invisible. Well, almost. They're translucent. So here is a dish from the lab with uh, three zebrafish larvae. And maybe you cannot see them yet, but maybe if we go a little closer. One, two, three zebrafish. 
are right here. And they're translucent because their bones are not opaque like ours yet. They will become opaque in the next couple of weeks and months. And when they're adults, they're just like normal fish. But right now they're still um, translucent. And that's really exciting to me. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I study the brain. I'm interested in the cells in the brain. And the zebrafish with this translucent head um, gives us the opportunity to look right on its brain. It's hard to imagine, but zebrafish also have a brain. It's right here. And you can see it through the skin. And just like in humans, our brain makes us who we are. It controls everything. When we walk, when we talk, and what we smell, the brain of the zebrafish also controls or um, what they do and when they smell something. And the brains of the zebrafish have about 20,000 cells. Our brain has much more cells. It has about 80 billion cells. And if you want to compare this to something that maybe makes more sense, 20,000 cells would be like a small city in terms of humans. So about 20,000 humans might live in a small city. 80 billion cells, that would be more humans than we have on the whole world. 10 times more, that's how many. Now let's get back um, to the fish smelling. How do we know they can smell? Well, we can kind of ask them. We have to watch them very closely. But for that, what I do in the lab is I bring the smell, the scent underwater. And I use something for that that you might know from the kitchen. It's called agar and it's used to make jello. So I uh, put the scent in the jello, in the agar, and I also put some food color here so you can see it. And then uh, I have these lanes that I fill with water and then I add small um, zebrafish larvae. And on one side, I put the agar with the scent and the food color. And on the other side, I put another agar without any color. And then when the water is in, you can see how the scent with the food color comes out, kind of like when you put a tea bag into a hot uh, cup of water. So let's watch this video together. Here comes the agar on both sides. And now I fill it with water. And here come the small zebrafish larvae. And you can see how the food color together with the scent is coming out of the, of the agar here. And I want you to watch these fish very closely and um, ask yourself, do they like what they smell? So if you watch them, what do you think? Do you think they love it or they hate it? And then we can see the results. What do you guys think? The scent in the agar, is, is it attractive to them or not? Yes, you're right. They hate it. You can tell that um, they're trying to stay uh, away from it. Maybe you can watch it a little longer. And um, what I do in my experiments is I basically look at their behavior and I count the time that they spend close to the site with the agar and, um, that they st and the time that they stay away from, from the agar and the scent. While I was doing these experiments, I saw something um, surprising, something that we call a discovery. I found that when the fish were stressed, that they stay away even more from, from the side um, with the odor. So they seem to hate it even more. Well, wait a minute, fish can be stressed? Before we talk about stress in fish, let's talk about stress in humans. When was the last time you were really stressed? Maybe when you have to speak in front of the class or maybe um, when you have to perform music or before a big game. Last time I was really stressed was um, when I was late for a flight and I could tell that my heart started racing and I started to blush and yeah, I could feel like a body reaction to the stress. And um, I want to ask you again, uh, when you are stressed, how does your body react? Do you blush? Uh, does your heart start to race? Do you even get sick maybe? Well, we can see that um, our body has a lot of different reactions when we're stressed. And most of the people seem to um, say that 
uh, my heart starts to race and my hands get sweaty. That's also a big one. But also we have people that start to stutter or my stomach hurts. Yeah. So our body has a lot of different ways um, how it reacts to stress. Did you know that just like fish, our sense of smell also starts to change when we're stressed? And things might start to smell more intense, like, for example, the trash can next to the house or maybe the grapes you forgot in your uh, breakfast bag. And scientists think that our sense of smell has developed as kind of a warning system. So you can imagine if you haven't eaten for days and your body is really, really stressed and you um, find these grapes, it's maybe not a good idea to eat them. Because it might mean that on top of all of your stress, because you're so hungry, you're also getting sick. So your super nose uh, might have just saved you there if you're not eating the grapes. So let's get back to our fish. When are fish stressed? This is a picture from my doctor's office. And you might have seen um, signs like these on an aquarium before. Please do not tap the glass. Thank you. And those signs make a lot of sense because fish get actually really stressed when you tap um, the glass. So uh, do not tap the glass. And um, that's how you, can, you know, how you can stress a fish. So in my research, I wonder, maybe um, these tiny fish can help us to understand something about ourselves when we study them and how our sense of smell changes when we are stressed. So let's get back to the fish for that. I have to make sure that my um, observations, my discovery was not just a coincidence. How do I do that? I repeat my experiments, something that we do in science a lot. It's very important to us. And uh, again, I put the agar on one side and um, uh, with, a, with a scent. And on the other side, I also put agar without a scent. And then I tap the fish after I've watched them. And then I watch them again and uh, I look what they're doing. So I again count the times that they're on one side and on the other side. And I find that they really stay away um, more from the side uh, where this odor is. This odor, by the way, is called cadaverine. It's a really um, horrible odor. It's, it, we can smell it too. And it's, it's really not nice how the name might tell you. So now I'm really curious what's happening in the brain. And remember, I told you that these little fish are almost invisible. They're translucent. And we can use that. We can look at them under the microscope. Our microscopes look uh, nothing like those ones. You might know from the school, maybe, or maybe from TV. I don't know. They look like this. They're giant. We actually built these microscopes ourselves in the lab. They're kind of like Lego to us. Um, we spend lots and lots of days uh, assembling these uh, microscopes. And here, uh, that's um, a pole up here on the right, um, is where the fish would sit, right here. And then we can use what we've learned from the experiments that I showed you before and just puff an odor at these fish when they're under the microscope. And we use um, a special light called a laser light. And that's coming here from the top. And with this light, um, we can see the brain of the fish. And in the brain of the fish, um, there is many cells, as I told you, 20,000, 10 to 20,000. And these cells start to glow when they're active, when they're sending information to another cell. And that's how we can see them. We perform these experiments in the dark because there's so little light uh, that comes from the brain. So we actually sit in the pitch dark the whole time um, when we do these experiments and um, we, we look at the brains. And um, here is a video. This video is not from my experiments, but it shows very nicely what we see. This is a fish brain and um, all the red and yellow you can see here are cells that are active that are sending information they're talking to each other you could say and you could imagine it kind of like this when the fish smells something there is information about the scent coming in and uh, through the nose and the cells in the nose send the information um, to cells in the brain so they talk to them basically and they say hey we smelled something and then these cells might send the information on and they say something like oh this smells awful and then the these cells uh, send information to the tail of the fish 
um, so the fish can swim away. Of course, it's much more complicated than that, but um, that kind of gives you an idea of what's happening. And so information from the nose would come in from this side, and this is where information uh, from the eyes comes in. Um, and on this side is where the information towards the tail goes. And this is a video, and I want to show you um, what this looks like. It kind of reminds me of a firework. So you can see that there's a lot of cells that are talking to each other that are active. And um, there is... Um, there was a big flash just now. Something big might just have happened um, to this fish. Wow, there was a giant uh, flash of information there. And uh, my job is now to find out what do these signals mean? What's happening in the brain of the fish? And uh, you can imagine uh, different things happening. So for example, we said these cells are talking, so cells might start to talk or cells might stop to talk when the fish smells something and they're stressed. Or um, they might send more information, so it's as, it's as if they're talking louder. Or a different area, like in this case here, uh, might be active here. This area is where, again, the information from the eye comes in. And um, while I'm giving you this talk, we're gathering more data. So we're looking at more brains, trying to find out when these fish smell things differently, when they're stressed, what is happening. And um, these experiments, they're of course different from what's happening in our brain when we're stressed and we smell something, but um, they might still teach us something. And between the fish brain and our brain, there are things that we call a general um, or that are the same, something that's the same underlying principle or a general principle. And I want to explain this to you by giving you an example. When I was little, I had a bobby car. And with this bobby car, I could drive around when I push the bobby car. So the bobby car needs me, uh, the power of me to move forward. It has four wheels and needs something to be moved forward. And of course, it's very different from a real car, um, but the real car also has four wheels and needs power to move. And by understanding the bobby car, we might get some ideas about the car. And that's kind of um, what's happening here when we study the zebra fish. It's not the same, but um, the general principles, the underlying rules um, might be similar. And uh, next time you're really stressed, I want you to hold on Try to smell something and um, just think, does it smell differently? What might be happening in your brain right now? Are there more cells active or less or a different region? And then, of course, next time you're in an aquarium, try not to tap the aquarium. And with this, uh, I, these are all the great pictures you saw in my talk. And I want to thank you all. Um, for your attention, and um, I'm happy to take all your questions. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, so we've got some really great questions here. Uh, the first question I have are, are there individual preferences for fish smells? Are there any weird fish who love the smell that other fish hate? So that's a great question. Um, with, so within our zebra fish, when we show them different um, odors or scents, like um, I showed you uh, in my experiments, there um, is some fish that have a, you know, a stronger opinion on that uh, scent. So they might stay away more um, than other fish. So we see these um, variations between fish. So um, just like humans, some might have a better nose. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we see the same in, in our fish. Interesting. Someone asks, uh, do scientists also dislike the smell that fish dislike? So for cadaverine, I can tell you, yes, that's, uh, it's a very, very strong smell. And we have another um, uh, scent called um, uh, putrescine. And there have been actually some complaints uh, in the neighboring labs when one of our uh, students, uh, one of our PhD students was making experiments using this odor. And uh, because it smelled so strongly. So, yeah, um, we just like them, too. <laughs> All right. Someone is asking, why do so many scientists study zebrafish in particular? 
Yeah, great question. So I was kind of touching on that um, with the uh, mentioning the genes. So um, for once they share uh, or have similar genes to us. So um, they also have genes that uh, are similar to some genes um, uh, that uh, code for certain diseases, for example. So they help us to study diseases. And then, um, as you've seen, like in the images with the eggs, they, um, it's, we can watch them while they're developing. So um, scientists study them to understand how development uh, works. And I think a big one is really that you have this window into the head because the larvae are translucent. So you can see um, what's happening in every cell while these uh, fish are active and, and swimming around. And that's something that's very unique. I mean, we can look into our head um, with um, MRIs, for example, or, or um, different techniques, but you can never see uh, or hardly see like single cells um, talking to each other. And that's something that we have here. We can see the whole brain because it's so small. And yeah. Interesting. Uh, someone wants to know, why was the microscope you showed so big? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, uh, for different reasons. And uh, one reason is uh, that we use uh, different lenses and these lens because we want to see something very small and these lenses need to have like a certain distance. And th this way, if you have like one lens and that's here and you know, okay, in order to see the zebrafish the, the, and, and, and the way the, the light basically works, it has to be in a certain uh, distance. And then uh, these things become very, very large. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can build them smaller, but um, the way we build them, they're very, very tall. <laughs> uh, someone wants to know, how did you decide you wanted to study fish smelling? That's a, that's a good question. So initially, I uh, wanted, to smell, uh, wanted to study learning in fish. And the way you study learning is you can combine something like an order with a reward, for example. You know, like... Um, uh, you, you can give them something nice to smell or something, just a, a neutral odor, and then you can either reward or punish them. But it turns out these little larvae, they're so little, and uh, they're basically like babies. They don't learn anything yet. But while I was doing these experiments, I got more and more interested in how do they smell at all? So what's happening when they're just smelling these odors I was using to, to teach them something? And that's what, when I came across this um, discovery together with the student that um, they smell differently when they're stressed, which is very exciting to me. Awesome. Uh, someone wants to know, can specific neurotransmitters be viewed while observing the zebrafish brain? Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, you, that's, that's something that you can also do in the lab where you have, uh, because they're um, these fish can be um, genetically manipulated. So you can actually have fish um, where only very specific uh, neurons or cells in the brain start to glow. And these ones can be cells that only have, for example, um, one neurotransmitter that you're interested in. Yeah, for example, like some one neurotransmitter would be GABA or yeah, something like that. Interesting. Someone else has another question about the zebrafish. They ask, uh, because zebrafish develops so quickly, does that mean it has a short lifespan? Um. The zebrafish, uh, compared to other fish, I, I assume, uh, the zebrafish um, does not have a particularly uh, short lifespan. There is other fish that develop even faster also throughout their life, and they die very, very early, yeah. But the zebrafish doesn't really. So back when we had the pole, we noticed a lot of people selected the shark instead of the salmon or the zebrafish as having a great sense of smell. Would you say that having big nostrils says that the um, fish can smell particularly well, or is that not really the case? That's a great question. And I um, have to admit, I don't know um, if that's the case. I think uh, lots of people chose the shark because, you know, it kind of plays with our fears um, uh, that they can smell so well. So imagine you cut yourself on a stone when you're in the ocean, all of a sudden the shark, you, you think the shark can smell you and comes to hunt you maybe. And I think that's why... Um, we always uh, think they can smell so so good, and they can smell very good. Um, but I think that's that's my hunch why people chose the shark in the polls. <laughs> uh, another question is: You mentioned salmon being able to smell their birth rivers. What exactly are they smelling? Oh, great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I have to admit. 
So uh, I'm not sure what they, um, if it's a combination of the things um, that can be found in this river, like um, you could imagine um, certain um, uh, minerals or things like that that are in the river that, uh, or things that grow in the river. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's, if it's um, actually totally known, but yeah. Gotcha. We've got a, crush, a question from Juliet that's not exactly related to smell, but it's still a good question. She wants to know, <laughs> why do sharks eat fish? Ooh, uh, good one. Um, not all sharks eat fish. Uh, there are sharks um, that are vegetarian, <laughs> one uh, big one. Um, and uh, they also eat uh, seals, for example. You might know that all the sharks that live here uh, in front of um, the Cape, they eat the seals and um, not fish. So I think it really depends on where these sharks live, kind of their, uh, their environment and um, what um, niche they fit into, um, how they, how they, what they eat. So some eat fish, some don't. Oh. Great answer. Uh, we've also got another question. Um, do fish use their smell to recognize each other like dogs or is there a sense of smell just to help them find food specifically? That's a, that's a great question. So here in the lab, we have some, had some experiments where um, we use something called happy water. And this happy water is actually the water that the siblings and the fish itself um, lived in. And when you take these fish out, uh, it seems like they become kind of what you could call lonely, right? Uh, they, they move less maybe. And when you put the happy water, the sibling water back into their um, tank, they all of a sudden uh, become, um, they move more and they seem like they're back um, to the behavior that they showed um, before. So they, it, it looks like they can actually um, tell who, how, what their siblings smell like because this experiment does not work if you just take any water from other fish. So it's really like a, what we would call a kin recognition in these fish. Yeah. Incredible. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Hanna. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was great being here. All righty. Well, thank you to everyone who asked such wonderful questions. Uh, it looks like that's all the time we have for our webinars today. Thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful day.